drew arch really comes to india uh, through the arabs through the persians and we indians added their own element we had these uh, uh, rose buds appearing and we had these foliated signs the which is unique to india you don't find this in the islamic world well, islamic was straight line would be there but this rose lotus buds appearing or this uh, the foils that appearing they look like this curved lines which is all the influence of india which makes it uniquely indian then also the use of inlay the lots of marble inlays and use of flower motifs which are not seen in islamic shrines plant flora and even fauna now in uh, for example elephants as part of in islamic palace or a fortress was introduced by moguls would do this and uh, this is not traditionally islam the use of animals use of plants use of uh, leaf motifs this would be not acceptable in most uh, geometrical patterns but they resemble leaves and flowers as we move forward in history we see changes and continuity in culture which also reflects in architecture we have seen this in harappan civilization we saw this in maurya and gupta period we've also seen it through temple architecture today in discussion with devdat patnayak we are going to focus on islamic architecture in india Hello everyone I am Manas Shrivastava and you are watching Art and Culture with Devdat Patnayak season 2 episode 4 welcome devdat devdat in this episode we are going to talk about islamic architecture now as i mentioned in the beginning that with history we see changes in uh, culture we see continuity also in culture which also gets reflected in architecture so just to begin if briefly you can talk about what developments are happening in this period where we are going to talk about islamic architecture which further gets reflected in architecture itself now in the 12th century something shifted in india um you had a new group of people entering the country and taking over the administrative structure we know that islam rose around the 7th century in arabia reached sindh in that period in the 10th century there were raids from afghanistan to the temples in india they were raiding for the wealth of the temples but in 12th century that is 200 years later you have the people from afghanistan from central asia from coming into india and settling down as rulers this had never happened before um in the from the 12th to the 14th century there were the sultanates which were established this is also the time globally when the mongol invasion took place and therefore lots of migration took place from iran from afghanistan from central asia uh to india so new ideas new people started entering the country between 12th and 14th century uh by the 15th and 16th century you have the mughal empire rising the mughals or timurids were of mongol descent who were inspired by persian culture but the islamic faith the islamic faith originates in arabia the persian culture is from iran um persia converted to islam and therefore you have the persian style of architecture you have the islamic faith and you have the local practices of the central asian all coming into india between the 12th and the 15th 16th century amplifying to the 17th uh, 18th century before the british take over so you see a shift in culture uh and this is a important part in history we uh, politically we talk about the temples being replaced by a new form of architecture the mosques uh the minarets the true arch we are talking about the dargahs and this shift in culture is expressed in architecture so you i know by earlier i saw a culture which had buddhist stupas and buddhist caves and monasteries uh in the mauryan period and the gupta period after the gupta period we started seeing temples with shikharas with jagatis with mandapas being built in north south and central india in bengal in kerala in gujarat in rajasthan and then after the 12th century we start the rise of new architecture mosques dargahs tombs of kings with a very different style Thank you Devdat for that brief outline of history which will help us to understand architecture of this period in a better manner. Now Devdat 
a very basic question but a very important question for all those who are trying to understand this particular uh, you know architectural cultural history for the first time is if you can uh, tell us what are the important elements or what does islamic architecture actually comprises of islamic architecture really comprises of three or four main kinds of temples there was the mosque or the jama masjid where everybody would come together and pray now this is the community prayer hall is very different from a hindu temple a hindu temple uh, has hierarchies and boundaries built it it is the house of god you go to visit god the purest of the pure the brahmins could enter the sanctum sanctorum the elite could enter the mandapas but the so called untouchables were not allowed to enter the temple and therefore you find a great tradition a hierarchy which expresses how the society was organized in an islamic masjid everybody is supposed to pray but this is also a political structure like the temple the temples were built by kings to show they were favored by the gods they would give lands to brahmins who would administer the local region and participate in the royal administrative process the brahmins were also serving as bureaucrats but if you see the the masjid the masjid is every friday prayer the king's name would be taken so if you are a king and you or you want to be a king you build a jama masjid and make sure that on friday your name is read out and people acknowledge you as a representative of god on earth which has been ratified by the khalif uh, or the caliph who are from Mecca originally, then it goes to Baghdad. So you need this connection; otherwise, you were not considered to be the Sultan. So the 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 Masjid is a very important structure. What makes it unique is the dome, the true arch, and the minaret, and uh, the qibla, which points towards Mecca. This is what makes a mosque. Now, across India, you have a mosque-like structure, which is not a mosque called a darga. Now, darga is where a holy man is buried and his uh, relic is worshipped. Now, this becomes this is a Sufi shrine, and this becomes very, very uh, popular across India. It's very important to remember in India, holy men were respected. The earlier stupas are in a way similar to the dargas. It's a shrine, a reliquary, a reliquary is where the relics of a holy man. is uh, placed either the bones or his body is located and this is something very unique it was there in buddhism it is there in sufism uh, hindus never kept bodies except of holy men the samadhis of holy men and monks or the chhatris of kings but generally the body was considered the dead body was considered inauspicious in hinduism and traditionally the dead body was not kept only very very few gurus would keep their bodies and people were considered this because they have attained nirvana um coming back to uh, the temple so besides the mosque beside the darga the third structure which is important is the tombs that were built large gigantic tombs were built by kings for themselves um you have the tombs of the lodi kings and this was a persian practice uh, the funny thing is if you go to persia or you go beyond that to the ottoman empire in turkey the kings did not bring big masoli for them they were they would build these tombs for them next to their uh, their teachers the sufi saints but this independent structure is something which was very popular in india and probably brought by the uh, the we know the lodi's practice this building their own tombs so the afghans did this and then the timurids did this this grand structures almost looking uh, aggrandizing the kings uh, surrounded by gardens and fountains which comes the another structure which was built which we don't normally talk about is the schools like the madrasa like in uh, bidar karnataka this was built by uh, a persian immigrant uh, who came to the karnataka region and built this huge madrasa university like big structure where students would be educated in the islamic way um we do know that uh, temples were broken their pillars were used to build the early mosque by the mamluk sultans so you do find this especially in delhi uh, you also find that uh, uh, the islamic architecture uh, uses this in the early period and is a bone of contention because temples were reused repurposed jain temples hindu temples were used for mosques and as we know it's a political issue but all there are the sultanates also create these minarets now this famous 
Qutb Minar. Uh, if you see the image of Qutb Minar, the Qutb Minar is not a minaret. It is not meant for a mosque. It looks like that, but it's a watchtower probably, or at least a symbol of power and celebration. It was built by uh, the Gori kings, the brothers. Now, one brother ruled uh, on the western side of the Hindu Kush, and that he built a very famous, um, the Minar of Jam. And then in Delhi, on the eastern side of the Hindu Kush, his brother builds the Khodub Minar. So these two pillars on the two ends of the empire. You see, we, we, we forget that the Hindu Kush east and west was controlled by many different kings. The Kushans also had uh, trade route control on the eastern as well as the western side of the Hindu Kush. In the same way, you have uh, the Mamluk kings. Mamluk, the word Mamluk means slaves and the uh, Central Asians in the, uh, had this practice of having slaves slaves uh, to working for them. The slave culture was very big, very different from the way we imagine slaves. Slave was a member of the family. And uh, the interesting things was sultans loved slaves because uh, if you are a member of the family, I mean, the real family, not the slave family, if you're the member of the real family, uh, you, when you go to battle, they are tribals and they have to share all the wealth with each, the brothers, cousins, uncles, nephews, they have to share it equally because you're a family, your bloodline. But if you're a slave, I don't have have to pay you. Uh, you're a slave, you're happy with clothes and food and I take care of you, but I don't have to pay you anything. And therefore, sultans loved slaves. And many times the slaves became very powerful and became heirs to the sultan. And Mamluk sultans were the ones, Iltamash, Aiba, come from this background. They come from uh, uh, slave background. Balban, the early sultans, come from this a uh, very different way of uh, functioning, social function, uh, social way of functioning. So, well, when we talk of Hindu temples, we talk of the Brahmins, we talk of the Kshatriyas. When we talk of Islamic cultures, we start talking about tribes. We talk about which tribe they belong to, were they slaves, uh, were they members of the royal family, which changes a lot of the equation. Thank you, Devdas, for that lucid answer. And I'm sure when students are listening to you, they're making notes of these very important elements of Islamic architecture, which you mentioned. For example, mosques, dargahs, minarets, madarsas. Also, that you have to study art and culture with reference to history. You should know the timeline and the development in histories, which will help you to understand, you know, uh, the development in architectural styles as well. Now, let's talk about Mughal architecture. Okay, so Devdat, we know that Mughal very consciously adopted Indian architectural elements and we see the Indian influence on the Mughal architecture. So if you can briefly tell us and talk about the Mughal architecture in India. You know, the Lodi kings came around the 14th century and they were not as rich uh, by the time the Mongol Empire, uh, you know, um, Mongol Chinggis Khan had spread across uh, the world and created havoc a few centuries in the 14th century. Uh, you have so end of 13th century is when the Mongols come, end of the 14th century is when Timur Lane comes, ransacks Delhi, Delhi Sultanate falls and you have the regional powers emerging. Um, uh, you know, various regional powers emerging. Then you have the Tughlaq kings who sort of uh, uh, manage, shift the capital from Delhi to Dalatabad, which is south of the Vindhyas, uh, which then the Tughlaq Empire collapses after Tamerlane. And then you have uh, the Bahamani kingdom em emerging in the south. So you see uh, that the Sultanate period was a tumultuous period. I always remember 1300 for the Mongol invasions, 1400 for Timur Lung uh, invasion, 1500 is when the Mughals start to uh, becoming uh, become important. So that's how I remember. Uh, Tughlaqs come just before Timur Lane, and after Timur Lane, uh, we have the Lodi period. Lodi period, you have these uh, rather grey monuments, very, they lack design, they're very grey. And you have these, instead of square shaped mosques, you have these octagonal mosques, the full dome uh, with the cupolas around it. But really the full dome, uh, what is interesting is this octagonal structure. It's very grey and they started using paints and wash, which was not being used before. But when the Mughals come in, new ideas come in, Mughals start coming, Babur comes first, then Humayu, and then of course Akbar. And um, Akbar is for me, is 16, I remember Akbar as 1600 because that's the time Queen Elizabeth ruled 
uh, England, 1600 is when Akbar, 1400 is Tamerlane, 1300 is Chinggis Khan, at, or at least Mongols descendants creating trouble, um, which is prevented. The Mongols did not enter India many ways. Uh, they entered what is called parts of Pakistan, but were blocked by the Khiljis. Um, then come the Tughlaqs, who uh, with Tamerlane that era comes to an end, then come the Lodhis, this period of Lodhis, and then the uh, Mughals, and the Mughals bring with them gunpowder. And that's what makes what is called the gunpowder empires. So between 1500 and 1600 AD, gunpowder was used. Once gunpowder came, elephants lost importance in the battlefield. The three gunpowder empires are India's Mughal Empire, Persia's Safavid Empire, which supported Babur at one time, and before and further to the uh, west, you have the Turkish Ottoman Empire. These were the three big Islamic empires, gunpowder empires, around 15th and 16th century. Mughals being the richest, because India was a very, very rich land, and the Mughals brought the char bagh system, the four square garden, uh, which they started, which they equated with paradise. This was an old Persian style garden, which is called the Persian garden, with a fountain in the center, four directions, very clearly um, linked to paradise, which was built around palaces and, of course, tombs of the kings. Uh, famous, uh, they start the, in architecture, when you talk about Mughal architecture, we must remember the use of marble. They started using marble and red sandstones and the red and white structure which emerged, which they made very popular. The famous uh, Taj Mahal built by Shah Jahan, you must remember the dome looks slightly different. If you look at, compare the dome of the Lodi structures, uh, in Mughal time, it is more like an onion shaped and you can see very clearly on top of the Taj Mahal, a inverted lotus structure which shows the Hindu influence and the pillars are pointing outward so that if there is an earthquake, they'll fall outside, not on the main structure. What you notice also is the absence of artwork. The Hindu temples were full of stories outside. You don't find stories, you find Islamic calligraphy. So calligraphy is important, but human forms are not allowed in Islam. That is an important thing to remember. This is the famous Buland Darwaza. Look at the Mughal architecture, the red and white structures being used, the Islamic motifs being carved, and a lot of inlay work. The Persians, when they came, many of the people who came from Central Asia loved glazed tiles. Uh, that is another thing which came to India, the use of glazed tiles, decorative motifs. Um, what India brought to the table, because most of the worksmen were for India, and this is a question that is often asked, is the inverted lotus that you find on top of the onion-shaped dome. Then you find that the gateways are true arches. Remember, true arch, Indians never had true arch. We may have had a true arch. There's some references to it, but we forgot about it. The true arch really comes to India uh, through the Arabs, through the Persians, and we Indians added their own element. We had these uh, uh, rosebuds appearing, and we had these these foliated signs, which is unique to India. You don't find this in the Islamic world. Islamic world, a straight line would be there, but this rose, lotus buds appearing, or this, uh, the foils that are appearing, they look like these curved lines, which is all the influence of India, which makes it uniquely Indian. Then also the use of inlay, the lots of marble inlays, and use of flower motifs, which are not seen in Islamic shrines, plant, flora, and even fauna. Now, in uh, for example, elephants as part of an Islamic palace or a fortress was introduced by Mughals would do this. And uh, this is not traditionally Islam. The use of animals, use of plants, use of uh, leaf motifs, this would be not acceptable in most uh, geometrical patterns, but they resemble leaves and flowers. But many other Indian influences which were seen in Mughal architecture are the jharokhas, the window or the balconies which project out of the house. There is the Bangla roof, the Bangla roof, which is this curvy linear thing. It was called the Bangla. It was only meant for the royal family uh, originally. Then the Chhatris or the Kutas, which are these pavilions. And of course, Chhajja. Chhajja is like a protrusion from the wall to prevent rain from falling because it's a monsoon country. These things were not seen in other parts of the world. So Chhajja is there. There is the Chhatri, Chhajja, Chhatri. These are all, you can think the monsoon impact. Then the Bangla, which is the bamboo effect of Bengal. And the Jharokas, which pull out of the house, which is seen in Rajasthan a lot. Um, now remember, all Islamic architecture is not the same. In South India, in Kerala, in the coastal region, there were a lot of Muslim 
traders who traveled by sea to uh, Kerala, to Karnataka, to the western coast of India, they built mosques, but they looked like the local temples. They were just thatched structures, not, no minaret, no dome, no true arch. Or if you go to Bengal, when you see some of the mosques in the Bengal region, they remember, again resemble the local Hindu temples. You see the Bangla, you see a little dome on top of it, but generally terracotta is being used, very different from the glazed tiles, stone structures, which were found in the uh, Indus Valley, more towards Pakistan, very different from the architecture of Bangladesh. Um, and thus you see that there is Islamic architecture is very different from the temple architecture of India. But there are variations within uh, Islamic architecture. The Bengal architecture is very different from the architecture of the Punjab region, from the Delhi region, from the Kerala region. And the architecture changes over time. What was seen in the Sultanate period is very different. The early Sultanate period then is very different from the Mughal period. The Mughal period uses a lot of... Uh, marble uses red and white marble contrasts. Uh, the sultanates are, are more stark. They have gray walls. Uh, uh, they are they are gradually using Hindu motifs. That's one of the unique features of Islamic art in India. The use of lotus flowers, rosebuds, flora and fauna in imagery. But there's also the foreign influences, the char bag, which comes during the Timurid or the Mughal times. And that is how cultures evolve. I'm sure that all these answers by you, Dev, that uh, students are going to pay attention to a lot of aspects. For example, they should understand the difference between the Sultanate and Mughal architecture. They should understand the foreign influence. They should understand the, the uh, how culture evolved and these important elements which were added in the architectural history of India. And then, of course, the regional variations, the, uh, as I mentioned, the foreign influence and so on and so forth. Now, before we end this particular episode, uh, we'd like to take a point to ponder with Devdath Patnayak and which will give us some hint that what we are going to discuss in the next episode. The Turuku Dharma which came from the West, the Hindu Dharma which evolved in Indian subcontinent. That is how architecture teaches us about our culture, about our heritage. Um, which brings us to now the British period. How did the British uh, culture and way of thinking and administrative practices change architecture in India? Because with the British comes the Industrial Revolution. It changed the whole world. We'll discuss that next time. All right then. So this is the point to ponder from Devdar Patnayak, which gives us a hint that in the next episode, we are going to talk about colonial architecture. And this brings us to the end of this episode of Art and Culture with Devdar Patnayak. Now, aspirants, you know that we have a lot of initiatives by the Indian Express to help you in your UPSC examination and other competitive exams. So do follow us. Do follow the UPSC section of the Indian Express on the IndianExpress.com. Also, watch a lot of uh, videos which will help you in value addition to your knowledge on the Indian Express YouTube channel. That's all from me today. Think smart, work hard, conquer your goal. Bye-bye.